Lord God, we thank you uh, for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would open each one of our hearts, each one of our minds, our lives to fully receive everything that you have for us this morning. We pray, God, that despite interruptions in technology, uh, that your word would flow freely uh, out of this place and that it would accomplish within each one of us everything that you set it forth to accomplish. Uh, for we pray in your name. Amen. So what does the Bible have to say about our current situation? What does the Bible have to say about uh, a global pandemic, social distancing, isolation, quarantine? Well, speaking of his own death in John 16, 32, Jesus says to his disciples, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. Now, Jesus is talking, of course, to the disciples uh, about their response to his arrest and trial and crucifixion, and, and he was right. I mean, after his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples did exactly as he predicted. They scattered each to their own home. And I suspect that sounds uh, really familiar to all of us. Although our reasons are different, uh, like the disciples, we too have scattered each to our own home. And this scattering can bring increased feelings of worry and anxiety and fear. However, we need to resist this as much as possible. We need to constantly fight against feelings of fear and hopelessness. Uh, Jesus gives us uh, the reason why in uh, the next verse, in verse 33. I'm just going to stop there for a second. Yeah, it stopped. Did I just do it? Yeah. I thought for a long time. So we're having technical difficulties. Your prayer. All right, so we're going to start again. Well, not again, but I'm going to start at verse 33. So Jesus uh, gives us the reason in verse 33 um, why we don't have to be worried or afraid. He says, uh, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The trials and challenges of life large, small, and even global, are inevitable. However, in the midst of these things, in the midst of COVID-19, Jesus wants us to have peace. And the reason we can have peace is because Jesus has overcome the world. In his death and resurrection, Jesus overcame our two greatest enemies, sin and death. And the rest, the rest is details. One of the best ways that we can experience peace in this season is to focus on God. Focus on His nature, on His character, and His promises. Promises that can be found in His very name, in who He is. And so, during this time of scattering, uh, we'll be reflecting on the names of God as a reminder of who we trust in, uh, how He promises to meet our needs in this season, and how we can be strengthened, comforted, and encouraged by it in this time of uncertainty. Last week, we began by looking at Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. This morning, I want to look at Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. 
Now, generally speaking, there are three things that can steal our peace, and I suspect that they're hitting us all, all at once right now. The first thing is lack of control. We can get frustrated when we have to wait or when things don't go our way or as we expected. It's frustrating to be stuck in our homes and unable to connect with family and friends or do the things that we would normally do. It's, it's frustrating when technology doesn't cooperate. Much of life is beyond our control, especially in this season. And this reality can frustrate us and rob our peace. When people won't change, that's another thing that can steal our peace. Have you ever tried to change somebody, a, a personal improvement program for your spouse or child or friend, and they're just not interested? These minor irritations can be heightened when we're living in such close quarters with each other. 24-7. And number three, when our problems are unexplainable. Even though we learn at a young age that life isn't fair, we still find this hard to accept. For whatever reason, things don't always turn out and not everybody lives happily ever after. And what makes it even more difficult is we don't always know why. This lack of understanding often leads to frustration, anxiety, and stress. I, I suspect we've all been feeling like this over the past few weeks as we struggle to make sense of what's going on. However, we need to remember that Jesus not only understands this, he sympathizes with us. And he wants to minister to us in this season. He, he wants us to have peace. In fact, God promises peace because he is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. This name first appears in the book of Judges, which describes a very dark time in the history of God's people. When the land was occupied by the Midianites, who were so oppressive, the Israelites lived in constant fear and were forced to scatter and hide in mountain caves. In Judges chapter 6, we're told that an angel of the Lord appeared to a man named Gideon while he was secretly threshing wheat. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior, the angel said. He then went on to promise that God would use Gideon to save his people. In Judges 6.24 reads, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Shalom is a Hebrew word that has so much richer in, in meaning than our English word peace, which usually refers to an absence of conflict or an absence of war. The concept of shalom includes wholeness, completeness, perfection, safety, wellness. In our reading this morning uh, that Gracie just read, Paul tells us that Jesus is our peace. And because of his death and resurrection, we who were once far off from God have been brought near. We're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and, and members of the household of God. As a result, we can know the fullness of God's shalom. We can have peace with God, peace within ourselves, and peace with each other. And if Jesus offers us this gift of peace, he means it. It's not something that we have to work for. It's not something that we even deserve. It's a free gift. So if we have this free gift, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is why is it so fleeting? Why are there times in my life when I'm not experienced peace? And I want to address this this morning. I want to look at how we can experience God as Jehovah Shalom in the midst of this pandemic. And know his peace, which Paul says surpasses all our understanding. Before we begin, I need to make it very clear that peace has nothing to do with problem-free living. If we have to wait until all our problems are solved to be at peace, we're never going to get there. As I've already said, the trials and challenges of life are inevitable. However, peace of mind doesn't come from conflict-free living. It's the result of three important decisions that we need to make. Decision number one, 
Accept what cannot be changed. Accept what cannot be changed. Worrying about what we can't change won't give us peace. Becoming resentful or bitter about what we can't change won't give us peace. Feeling guilty about the things uh, that can't be changed won't give us peace. And having self-pity over things that can't be changed won't give us peace. The only thing that will bring peace in our lives is accepting what can't be changed. Think about it. The Apostle Paul was taken to Rome. He was imprisoned. He was awaiting execution. And it was during this time that he wrote his letter to the Philippians, which ironically is said to be the most positive, joy-filled book in the New Testament. In Philippians 4.11, Paul writes, I have learned to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. I know how to live when I'm poor and I know how to live when I have plenty. I have learned the secret of being happy at any time in everything. I can do all things through Christ because he gives me strength. Paul tells us two things about acceptance here. Number one, it's learned. And number two, we need God's power to do it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As I've already said, one of the things that keeps us from knowing God's peace is our need to understand. Often when something goes wrong in life, we cry out for answers. Why God? Or why is this happening? Perhaps you've been doing that over these last few weeks. However, as we all know, we rarely find the answers to these questions because so much of life is beyond our understanding. And so when we find ourselves in this situation, we need to remember three things. Number one, even though God loves us, he doesn't owe us an explanation. Even though God loves us, he doesn't owe us an explanation. As we read in Romans 9 verses 20 to 21, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me? Does not the potter have the right to make out the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and for common use? God is good and God is just and fair and loving. He's the creator. We're the creation. He doesn't owe us an explanation. The second thing we need to remember is even if God did explain, we probably wouldn't understand. As we read in Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's mind is so much greater than ours, and try as we may, we cannot possibly comprehend all the ways of God. Right? There are forces at work in our life, in our world, throughout history, that if God took the time to explain to us how generations affect generations and so on, we still wouldn't understand it. And the third thing that we need to remember is explanations rarely bring peace. Explanations rarely bring peace. Sometimes we think, if I just knew why this happened, then it would make peace. Then I would have peace, or it would make sense. But even if God gave us an explanation, even if we understood, I mean, we'd still be upset. Tragedy is tragedy. Loss is loss. Social distancing is social distancing. Isolation is isolation. What brings us comfort in these moments is the presence of God in our life. Not explanations, but his care and his concern. As Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. When I was uh, confirmed, my grandmother gave me a silver plaque with the serenity prayer engraved on it. Maybe you're familiar with the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, 
the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, there's a second part to this prayer that many people don't know. So God grant me the, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you, God, will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. It's too bad the whole prayer is too long to, to put on a plaque because I think all the power is in the second part. It's only through acceptance and trust that we can find true and lasting peace. God is Jehovah Jireh. He is our peace. But experiencing his peace in this season means accepting what cannot be changed. Decision number two is trust in God's loving care. Trust in God's loving care. Isaiah 26 verse 3 reads, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now, as I said earlier, there's no such thing as a problem-free life, right? There's always going to be something. In fact, uh, it seems like uh, the minute that I deal with one problem, uh, I have another problem. And I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is life. Why is this? Why do we experience so many problems in life? Well, let me give you four very quick reasons. Number one, Adam blew it. Adam blew it. Romans 5 verse 12 reads, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. Adam and Eve gave into temptation, allowing sin to come into the world, and we're all paying the price. Number two, we have a common enemy. We have a common enemy, Satan. Now, all we have to do is turn on the news and we can see evidence of his influence and his work everywhere. And so we read in 1 Peter 5, 8, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have problems in life because we have a common enemy. Reason number three, we blow it. I don't know about you, but many of the problems in my life are the consequences of my own bad decisions. As we read in Galatians 6, 7, do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always reap what you sow. And finally, number four, life happens. Sometimes the pain in our life is no one's fault. One day, we're told Jesus was walking down the street and he encountered a man born blind. And the disciples asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Unfortunately, this kind of thinking is still around today, right? Who sinned? Whose fault is it? Who's to blame? And Jesus responds, neither. This happened so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. Like the blind man, sometimes problems come into our life for no understandable reason. But we need to see them as opportunities for God's glory to be displayed. Now, most of us respond to the unexplainable and uncontrollable situations of life in one of two ways, and both of which aren't helpful. Maybe you've responded in one or both of these ways in the past few weeks. We either try harder, we grit our teeth and we push on. The more out of control life gets, the more controlling we get. Or number two, we wave the white flag and we surrender. We give up and fall into hopelessness and despair. Instead of these we need to choose God's third option. 
regardless of why we're going through this pandemic, regardless of where it came from, our best response is to trust in God's loving care. As we read in 1 Peter 5, 7, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. God is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. However, experiencing this peace in this season means trusting in his loving care. And finally, decision number three, surrender to God's loving control. Surrender to God's loving control. Every day when we wake up, we have a decision to make. Who is going to be in charge in my life, me or God? Now, often we make the wrong choice and we take the driver's seat. And why do we do that? Because we think that we know better, right? We want to make our own rules. We want to go our own way. And I don't know about you, but experience has taught me that the more I try to take control, the more miserable I become and the more out of control my life is. Scripture is very clear about this. Romans 8, 6 reads, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. All right, it's, it's pretty simple here, according to Paul. We've, we've got two choices, death or life, and with life comes peace. Now, I don't believe that God brings bad things into our lives. He may permit them, but he doesn't cause them. However, he definitely uses them. He uses them to shape our character. He uses them to force us on our knees. And he uses them to remind us that we are totally dependent on him. And I think that this might be one of the big lessons for us in this season. I mean, this is one of the big lessons for us today with technology not cooperating. Right? We are 100% dependent on God. If we want to experience God's peace, spirit, soul, and body, we need to surrender control of our life to him. As we read in James chapter 4, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So how do we know if we've done this? Well, the evidence of a surrendered life is always obedience. The evidence of a surrendered life is always obedience. In other words, when God says, do it, I do it. I do it even if it doesn't, if I don't understand. I do it even if nobody else is doing it. I do it if it's difficult or even impossible. I do it simply out of obedience. God is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. However, experiencing this peace in this season means surrendering to his loving control. Now, I know that I don't need to tell anyone that we are all in an uncontrollable situation right now. And in addition to social isolating, staying home and washing our hands, all that we can really do at the end of the day is trust in God. Right? We may not understand what's going on and we may not know when this is going to end, when life will go back to normal, if indeed life will ever be the same again after this. However, we do know that God has a greater purpose for our life than the problems we're going through today. We know that he's more interested in our character than in our comfort, that he wants to build us up and transform us into the likeness of Jesus. We know that God loves us deeply, that he is ultimately in control and he wants us to trust him. One of my favorite verses uh, in the Bible is Isaiah 54.10, and I used it earlier this week in one of our midday prayers. Isaiah 54.10, the mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. I will keep forever my promise of peace. So says the Lord who loves you. When we're hit by the storms of life, by trials and challenges and things we don't understand, by COVID-19, 
it can feel like the mountains and hills are crumbling around us, like everything is falling apart. Like there's this great shaking in our lives and, and in the world around us. However, it's in these moments that we need to remember that we're not alone. Our God is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And we can know this peace in the midst of the crumbling and in the midst of the shaking. This is what our faith is all about. Not that life is going to be easy. Not that things are always going to work out as we planned or would like. But that no matter what happens, God is with us. And he will keep his promises. And his love, his power, and his peace is greater than anything this world can throw at us. In the midst of this global pandemic, it just still sounds strange to say that. I mean, in the midst of our scattering, are you willing to accept things that can't be changed? Are you willing to trust in God's loving care? And are you willing to surrender to his loving control? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are uh, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And we pray that as we trust you, uh, as we surrender to you, and as we accept what we cannot control, Lord, that we would know within ourselves that peace which passes all our understanding and that you, Lord, would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. For we pray, Lord, in your most holy name. Amen. So I think what we're going to do, because we're having uh, internet connections and uh, issues, and I suspect it's very frustrating for all of you, if indeed you're even still watching, I think we're going to skip uh, right to the end of our service. We're going to sing our closing song, uh, and uh, then we're going to end this morning a bit early, and we're going to try to figure out why we've uh, uh, had so many issues this morning. So I want you to join us in singing God of Angel Armies. You are my morning song, though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You trust the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who goes behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. Angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your hand, for you alone can save. 